Madame Krell's Ghost by Joseph Sheridan Lefanu and read by Christopher Halton. Madame Krell's Ghost was published in 1870. They said she was possessed by the devil and more than half a ghost. Ye little limb, what for did you say I killed the boy? I'll tickle you till you're stiff. Twenty years have passed since you last saw Mrs. Jolliffe's tall, slim figure. She is now past seventy and can't have many milestones more to count on the journey that will bring her to her long home. The hair has grown white as snow that is parted under her cap over her shrewd but kindly face, but her figure is still straight and her step light and active. She has taken of late years to the care of adult invalids, having surrendered to younger hands the little people who inhabit cradles and crawl on all fours. Those who remember that good-natured face among the earliest that emerge from the darkness of non-entity and who owe to their first lessons in the accomplishment of walking and a delighted appreciation of their first babblings and earliest teeth have spired up into tall lads and lasses now. Some of them show streaks of white by this time in brown locks, the bonny gooden hair that she was so proud to brush and show to admiring mothers who are seen no more on the green of Golden Friars, and whose names are traced now on the flat grey stones in the churchyard. So the time is ripening some and searing others, and the saddening and tender sunset hour has come, and it is evening with the kind old North Country dame, who nursed pretty Laura Mildmay, who now stepping into the room smiles so gladly, and throws her arms around the old woman's neck, and kisses her twice. Now this is so lucky, said Mrs. Jenner. You have just come in time to hear a story. Really, that's delightful. Na na, odd white it. No story, our true for that. I sid it away, my an an. But the barn here would not like at these hours just go into a bed to hear tell of freets and boggarts. Ghosts, the very thing of all others I should most likely to hear of. Well, dear, said Mrs. Jenner. If you are not afraid, sit you down here with us. She was just going to tell me all about her first engagement to attend a dying old woman, says Mrs. Jenner, and of the ghost she saw there. Now, Mrs. Jolliffe, make your tea first and then begin. The good woman obeyed, and having prepared a cup of that companionable nectar, she sipped a little, drew her brows slightly together to collect her thoughts, and then looked up with a wondrous solemn face to begin. Good Mrs. Jenner and the pretty girl each gazed with eyes of solemn expectation in the face of the old woman, who seemed to gather awe from the recollections she was summoning. The old room was a good scene for such a narrative, with the oak wainscoting, quaint and clumsy furniture, the heavy beams that crossed its ceiling, and the tall four-post bed, with dark curtains within which you might imagine what shadows you please. Mrs. Jolliffe cleared her voice rolled her eyes slowly round, and began her tale in these words. I'm an old woman now, and I was but thirteen, my last birthday, the night I came to Applewale House. My aunt was the housekeeper there, and a sort of one-horse carriage was down at Lexo waiting to take me and my box up to Applewale. I was a bit frightened by the time I got to Lexo, and when I saw the carriage and horse, I wished myself back again with my mother at Hazeldon. I was crying when I got into the shay, that's what we used to call it, and old John Mulberry that drove it, and was a good-natured fellow, bought me a handful of apples at the Golden Lion to cheer me up a bit, and he told me that there was a currant cake and tea and pork chops waiting for me, all hot in my aunt's room at the great house. It was a fine moonlight night, and I ate the apples looking out of the shay window. It's a shame for gentlemen to frighten a poor foolish child like I was. I sometimes think it might be tricks. There was two on em on the tap of the coach beside me, and they began to question me after nightfall, when the moon rose, where I was going to. Well, I told them it was to wait on Dame Arabella Crowell of Applewale House, nearby Lexo. Ho then, says one of them, you'll not be long there. And I looked at him as much as to say why not, for I had spoken out when I told them where I was going as if t'was something clever I had to say. Because, says he, and don't you for your life tell no one, only watch her and see, she's possessed by the devil, and more and half a ghost. Have you got a Bible? Yes, sir, says I. 
for my mother put my little Bible in my box, and I knew it was there. And by the same token, though the print's too small for my old eyes, I have it in my press to this hour. As I looked up at him, saying, Yes, sir, I thought I saw him winking at his friend, but I could not be sure. Well, says he, be sure you put it under your bolster every night. It will keep the old girl's claws aff ye. And I got such a fright when he said that, you wouldn't fancy. And I'd a like to ask him a lot about the old lady, but I was too shy, and he and his friend began talking together about their own consarns, and dowly enough I got down, as I told ye, at Lexo. My heart sank as I drove into the dark avenue. The trees stand very thick and big, as old as the old house almost, and four people with their arms out and fingertips touching, barely girds round some of them. Well, my neck was stretched out of the window, looking for the first view of the great house, and all at once we pulled up in front of it. A great white and black house it is, with great black beams across and right up it, and gables looking out as white as a sheet to the moon, and the shadows of the trees, two or three up and down in front. You could count the leaves on them, and all the little diamond-shaped window panes glimmering on the great hall window and great shutters in the old fashion hinged on the wall outside, bolted across all the rest of the windows in front, for there was but three or four servants, and the old lady in the house, and most of the rooms, was locked up. My heart was in my mouth when I said the journey was over, and this the great house afore me, and I saw near my aunt that I never said till knew, and Dame Crowell that I was come to wait upon, and was afeard on already. My aunt kissed me in the hall and brought me to her room. She was tall and thin, with a pale face and black eyes and long thin hands with black mittens on. She was past fifty and her word was short, but her word was law. I have no complaints to make of her, but she was a hard woman, and I think she would have been kinder to me if I had been her sister's child in place of her brother's, but all that's of no consequence new. The squire, his name was Mr. Chevenix Crowell, he was Dame Crowell's grandson, came down there by way of seeing that the old lady was well treated, about twice or thrice in the year. I sit him but twice all the time I was at Applewale House. I can't say but she was well taken care of, notwithstanding, but that was because my aunt and Meg Wyvern, that was her maid, had a conscience and did their duty by her. Mrs. Wyvern, Meg Wyvern, my aunt, called her to herself, and Mrs. Wyvern to me was a fat, jolly lass of fifty a good height and a good breadth, always good-humoured and walked slow. She had fine wages, but she was a bit stingy and kept all her fine clothes under lock and key, and wore, mostly, a twilled chocolate cotton, with red and yellow and green sprigs and balls on it, and it lasted wonderful. She never gave me now, not the valley of a brass thimble, all the time I was there, but she was good-humoured and always laughing, and she talked no end of proas over her tea. And seeing me so sackless and dowly, she roused me up with her laughing and stories, and I think I liked her better than my aunt. Children is so taken with a bit of fun or a story, though my aunt was very good to me, but a hard woman about some things, and silent always. My aunt took me into her bedchamber that I might rest myself a bit while she was setting the tea in her room, but first she patted me on the chauffeur and said I was a tall lass of my years, and had spied up well and asked me if I could do plain work and stitching, and she looked in my face, and said I was like my father, her brother, that was dead and gone, and she hoped I was a better Christian, and wadna do o' that lids, would not do anything of that sort. It was a hard saying the first time I set foot in her room, I thought. When I went into the next room, the housekeeper's room, very comfortable oak all round, there was a fine fire blazing away, with coal and peat and wood, all in a low together, and tea on the table, and hot cake and smoking meat. And there was Mrs. Wyvern, fat, jolly, and talking away, more in an hour than my aunt would in a year. While I was still at my tea, my aunt went upstairs to see Madame Crowell. She's a-gone up to see that old Judith Squales is awake, says Mrs. Wyvern. Judith sits with Madame Crowell when me and Mrs. Shutters, that was my aunt's name, is away. She's a troublesome old lady. You'll have to be sharp with her, or she'll be into the fire, or out at a window. She goes on wires, she does, old though she be. How old, ma'am, says I. Ninety-three her last birthday, and that's eight months gone, says she, and she laughed. 
and don't be asking questions about her before your aunt. Mind, I tell you, just take her as you find her, and that's all. And what's to be my business about her, please, ma'am, says I. About the old lady, well, says she, your aunt, Mrs. Shutters, will tell you that, but I suppose you'll have to sit in the room with your work and see she's at no mischief, and let her amuse herself with her things on the table, and get her her food or drink as she calls for it, and keep her out of mischief, and ring the bell hard if she's troublesome. Is she deaf, ma'am? No, nor blind, says she, as sharp as a needle, but she's gone quite orpy and can't remember now rightly, and Jack the Giant Killer or Goody Two-Shoes will please her as well as the King's Court or the affairs of the nation. And what did the little girl go away for, ma'am, that went on Friday last? My aunt wrote to my mother she was to go. Yes, she's gone. What for, says I again. She didn't answer Mrs. Shutters, I do suppose, says she. I don't know. Don't be talking. Your aunt can't abide a talking child. And please, ma'am, is the old lady well in health, says I. It ain't no harm to ask that, says she. She's torfling a bit lately, but better this week past, and I dare say she'll last out her hundred years yet. Hish! Here's your aunt coming down the passage. In comes my aunt, and begins talking to Mrs. Wyvern, and I, beginning to feel more comfortable and at home-like, was walking about the room looking at this thing and at that. There was pretty old china things on the cupboard, and pictures again the wall and there was a door open in the wainscot, and I sees a queer old leathern jacket, with straps and buckles to it, and sleeves as long as the bedpost hanging up inside. What's that you're at, child, says my aunt, sharp enough, turning about when I thought she least minded. What's that in your hand? This, ma'am, says I, turning about with the leathern jacket. I don't know what it is, ma'am. Pale as she was, the red came up in her cheeks, and her eyes flashed with anger and I think only she had half a dozen steps to take between her and me. She'd have given me a scissor, but she did give me a shake by the chauffeur, and she plucked the thing out of my hand, and says she, While ever you stay here, don't you meddle with nout that don't belong to ye. And she hung it up on the pin that was there, and shut the door with a bang and locked it fast. Mrs. Wyvern was lifting up her hands and laughing all this time, quietly in her chair, rolling herself a bit in it, as she used when she was kinking. The tears was in my eyes, and she winked at my aunt, and says she, drying her own eyes that was wet with the laughing, tut, the child meant no harm. Come here to me, child, it's only a pair of crutches for lame ducks, and ask us no questions, mind, and we'll tell you no lies. And come here and sit down, and drink a mug of beer before you go to your bed. My room, mind ye, was upstairs, next to the old lady's, and Mrs. Wyvern's bed was near hers in her room and I was to be ready at call, if need should be. The old lady was in one of her tantrums that night, and part of the day before. She used to take fits of the sulks. Sometimes she would not let them dress her, and at other times she would not let them take her clothes off. She was a great beauty, they said in her day. But there was no one about Applewell that remembered her in her prime, and she was dreadful fond of dress, and had thick silks and stiff satins and velvets and laces and all sorts, enough to set up seven shops at the least. All her dresses was old-fashioned and queer, but worth a fortune. Well, I went to my bed. I lay for a while awake, for a things was new to me, and I think the tea was in my nerves too, for I wasn't used to it, except now and then on a holiday or the like, and I heard Mrs. Wyvern talking, and I listened with my hand to my ear, but I could not hear Mrs. Crowell, and I don't think she said a word. There was great care took of her. The people at Applewell knew that when she died they would everyone get the sack, and their situations was well paid and easy. The doctor came twice a week to see the old lady, and you may be sure they all did as he bid them. One thing was the same every time. They were never to cross or from her, any way, but to humour and please her in everything. So she lay in her clothes all that night, and next day not a word she said, and I was at my needlework all that day in my own room, except when I went down to my dinner. I would have liked to see the old lady and even to hear her speak, but she might as well have been in London at the time for me. When I had my dinner, my aunt sent me out for a walk for an hour. I was glad when I came back, the trees were so big and the place so dark and lonesome, and t'was a cloudy day, 
and I cried a deal, thinking of home, while I was walking alone there. That evening, the candles being alight, I was sitting in my room, and the door was open into Madame Crowell's chamber, where my aunt was. It was then, for the first time, I heard what I suppose was the old lady talking. It was a queer noise, like I couldn't well say which, a bird or a beast, only it had a bleating sound in it, and was very small. I pricked my ears to hear all I could, but I could not make out one word she said, and my aunt answered, The evil one can't hurt no one, ma'am, bout the law permits. Then the same queer voice from the bed says something more that I couldn't make head nor tail on. And my aunt made answer again, Let them pull faces, ma'am, and say what they will. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? I kept listening with my ear turned to the door, holding my breath, but not another word or sound came in from the room. In about twenty minutes, as I was sitting by the table, looking at the pictures in the old Aesop's fables, I was aware of something moving at the door, and looking up I sid my aunt's face looking in at the door, and her hand raised. Hish, says she, very soft, and comes over to me on tiptoe, and she says in a whisper, Thank God she's asleep at last, and don't you make no noise till I come back, for I'm going down to take my cup of tea, and I'll be back in new, me and Mrs. Wyvern, and she'll be sleeping in the room, and you can run down when we come up, and Judith will give you your supper in my room. And with that she goes. I kept looking at the picture book as before, listening every new and then, but there was no sound, not a breath that I could hear, and I began whispering to the pictures and talking to myself to keep my heart up, for I was growing feared in that big room. And at last up I got, and began walking about the room, looking at this and peeping at that to amuse my mind, you'll understand. And at last, what said I do, but peeps into Madame Crowell's bedchamber. A grand chamber it was, with a great four-poster, with flowered silk curtains as tall as the ceiling, and folding down on the floor, and drawn close all around. There was a looking-glass, the biggest I ever sid before, and the room was a blaze alight. I counted twenty-two wax candles all alight. Such was her fancy, and no one dared say her nay. I listened at the door and gaped and wondered all around. When I heard there was not a breath, and did not see so much as a stir in the curtains, I took heart, and walked into the room on tiptoe, and looked round again. Then I takes a keek at myself in the big glass, and at last it came in my head. Why couldn't I had a keek at the old lady herself in the bed? Ye'd think me a fool if you knew half how I longed to see Dame Crowell, and I thought to myself if I didn't peep now, I might wait many a day before I got so good a chance again. Well, my dear, I came to the side of the bed, the curtains being close, and my heart almost failed me, but I took courage, and I slips my finger in between the thick curtains, and then my hand, so I waits a bit, but all was still as death. So softly, softly I draws the curtain, and there, sure enough, I sid before me, stretched out like the painted lady on the tomb Stean in Lexo Church, the famous Dame Crowell of Applewale House. There she was, dressed out. You never sid the like in thee days, satin and silk and scarlet and green, and gold and pint lace. By Jen, twas a sight. A big powdered wig, half as high as herself, was atop of her head, and, wow, was ever such wrinkles and her old baggy throat all powdered white, and her cheeks rouged, and mouse-skin eyebrows that Mrs. Wyvern used to stick on, and there she lay proud and stark, with a pair of clocked silk hose on, and heels to her shoon as tall as ninepins, lork, but her nose was crooked and thin, and half the whites of her eyes was open. She used to stand, dressed as she was, giggling and dribbling before the looking-glass, with a fan in her hand and a big nosegay in her bodice. Her wrinkled little hands were stretched down by her sides, and such long nails, all cut into points, I never sid in my days. Could it even have been the fashion for grit folk to wear their fingernails so? Well, I think you'd have been frightened yourself if you'd have sid such a sight. I couldn't let go the curtain, nor move an inch, nor take my eyes off her. My very heart stood still and in an instant she opens her eyes, and up she sits, and spins herself round, and down with her, with a clack on her two tall heels on the floor, facing me, ogling in my face with her two great glassy eyes, and a wicked simper with her wrinkled lips and Langfowl's teeth. 
Well, a corpse is a natural thing, but this was the dreadfulest sight I ever sid. She had her fingers straight out pointing at me, and her back was crooked round again with age. Says she, Ye little limb, what for did you say I killed the boy? I'll tickle you till you're stiff. If I'd a thought an instant, I'd a turned about and run, but I couldn't take my eyes off her, and I backed from her as soon as I could, and she came clattering after like a thing on wires, with her fingers pointing to my throat, and she making all the time a sound with her tongue like ziz, ziz, ziz. I kept backing and backing as quick as I could, and her fingers was only a few inches away from my throat, and I felt I'd lose my wits if she touched me. I went back this way right into the corner, and I gave a yellock, you'd think Saul and body was parting, and that minute my aunt from the door calls out with a blare, and the old lady turns round on her, and I turns about and ran through my room and down the stairs, as hard as my legs could carry me. I cried hearty, I can tell you, when I got down to the housekeeper's room. Mrs. Wyvern laughed a deal when I told her what happened, but she changed her key when she heard the old lady's words. Say them again, says she. So I told her. Ye little limb, what for did you say I killed the boy? I'll tickle you till you're stiff. And did you say she killed a boy, says she? Not I, ma'am, says I. Judith was always up with me after that, when the two elder women was away from her. I would have jumped out at window rather than stay alone in the same room with her. It was about a week after, as well as I can remember, Mrs. Wyvern, one day when me and her was alone, told me a thing about Madame Crowell that I did not know before. She, being young and a great beauty, full seventy year before, had married Squire Crowell of Applewale, but he was a widower and had a son about nine years old. There never was tale or tidings of this boy after one morning. No one could say where he went to. He was allowed too much liberty and used to be off in the morning one day to the keeper's cottage and breakfast with him and away to the warren, and not home mayhap till evening, and another time down to the lake and bathe there, and spend the day fishing there, or paddling about in the boat. Well, no one could say what was gone with him, only this, that his hat was found by the lake, under a hawthorn that grows there to this day, and t'was thought he was drowned bathing, and the squire's son, by his second marriage, with this Madame Crowell that lived so dreadful lang, came in far the estates, it was his son, the old lady's grandson, Squire Shevenix Crowell, that owned the estates at the time I came to Applewale. There was a deal of talk lang before my aunt's time about it, and twas said the stepmother knew more than she was like to let out, and she managed her husband, the old squire, with her white heft and flatteries, and as the boy was never seen more, in course of time, the thing died out of folks' minds. I'm going to tell you now about what I said with my own een. I was not there six months, and it was winter time when the old lady took her last sickness. The doctor was afeard she might have took a fit of madness, as she did fifteen years before, and was buckled up many a time in a straight waistcoat, which was the very leathern jerkin I sid in the closet off my aunt's room. Well, she didn't. She pined and winded and went off, torflin, torflin, quiet enough till a day or two before a flitting, and then she took to rabbling and sometimes skirling in the bed, you'd think a robber had a knife to her throat, and she used to work out of the bed, and not being strong enough then to walk or stand, she'd fall on the floor with her all wizened hands stretched before her face, and skirling still for mercy. You may guess I didn't go into the room, and I used to be shivering in my bed with fear, at her skirling and scraffling on the floor, and blaring out words that I make your skin turn blue, my aunt and Mrs. Wyvern and Judith Squales and a woman from Lexo was always about her. At last she took fits and they wore her out. T. Sir was there and prayed for her, but she was past praying with. I suppose it was right, but none could think there was much good in it, and say at lang last she made a flitting, and her was over, and old Dame Crowell was shrouded and coffined, and Squire Chevenix was wrote for, but he was away in France and the delay was so lang that to sir and doctor both agreed it would not do to keep her langer out of her place, and no one cared but just them two, and my aunt and the rest of us, from Applewale to go to the burying. So the old lady of Applewale was laid in the vault under Lexo Church, and we lived up at the great house till such time as the squire should come to tell his will about us, 
and pay off such as he chose to discharge. I was put into another room, two doors away from what was Dame Crowell's chamber after her death, and this thing happened the night before Squire Chevenix came to Applewale. The room I was in now was a large square chamber covered with yak panels, but unfurnished except for my bed, which had no curtains to it, and a chair and a table or so that looked nothing at all in such a big room, and the big looking glass that the old lady used to keek into and admire herself from head to heel, now that there was no mare of that walk, was put out of the way, and stood against the wall in my room, for there was shifting a many things in her chamber, ye may suppose, when she came to be coffined. The news had come that day that the squire was to be down next morning at Applewale, and not sorry was I, for I thought I was sure to be sent home again to my mother, and right glad was I, and I was thinking of her at hame and my sister Janet and the kitten and the pie mag and Trimmer the tyke and all the rest, and I got so fidgety I couldn't sleep, and the clock struck twelve and me wide awake and the room as dark as pick. My back was turned to the door, and my eyes toward the wall opposite. Well, it couldn't be a full quarter past twelve when I sees a lighting on the wall before me, as if something took fire behind, and the shadows of the bed and the chair and my gown that was hanging from the wall was dancing up and down on the ceiling beams and the yak panels, and I turns my head o'er my chauffeur quick, thinking something must have gone afire. And what said I see by Jen, but the likeness of the old beldame bedizened out in her satins and velvets, on her dead body simpering, with her eyes as wide as saucers, and her face like the fiend himself. "'Twas a red light that rose about her in a fuffin' low, "'as if her dress round her feet was blazing. "'She was driving on right for me, "'where her old shrivelled hands crooked as if she was going to claw me. "'I could not stir, but she passed me straight by with a blast of cold air, "'and I sid her at the wall in the alcove, as my aunt used to call it, "'which was a recess where the state bed used to stand in, "'all times we a door open wide, "'and her hands groping in at something was there. I never sid that door before, and she turned round to me like a thing on a pivot, flyering, and all at once the room was dark, and I standing at the far side of the bed. I don't know how I got there, and I found my tongue at last, and if I did na blare a yellock, renning down the gallery, and almost pulled Mrs. Wyvern's door off to hooks, and frighted her half out of wits. Ye may guess I did no sleep that night, and with the first light down with me to my aunt as fast as my two legs could carry me. Well, my aunt did not frump or flight me as I thought she would, but she held me by the hand and looked hard in my face all the time, and she telt me not to be feared, and says she, Heed the appearance a key in its hand? Yes, says I, bringing it to mind, a big key and a queer brass handle. Stop a bit, says she, letting go my hand and opening the cupboard door. Was it like this, says she, taking one out in her fingers and showing it to me with a dark look in my face. That was it, says I, quick enough. Are you sure, she says, turning it round. Sart, says I, and I felt like I was gain to faint when I sid it. Well, that will do, child, says she, softly thinking, and she locked it up again. The squire himself will be here today before twelve o'clock, and you must tell him all about it, says she, thinking, and I suppose I'll be leaving soon, and so the best thing for the present is that you should go home this afternoon, and I'll look out another place for you when I can. Fain was I, ye may guess, at that word. My aunt packed up my things for me, and the three pounds that was due to me to bring home, and Squire Crowell himself came down to Applewell that day, a handsome man, about thirty years old. It was the second time I sid him, but this was the first time he spoke to me. My aunt talked with him in the housekeeper's room, and I don't know what they said. I was a bit feared on the squire, he being a great gentleman down in Lexo, and I darn't go near till I was called. And says he, smiling, What's a this year send, child? It mun be a dream, for you know there's nay sick a thing as a bow or a freet in other world. But whatever it was, my little maid, sit ye down and tell all about it from first to last. Well, so soon as I made an end, he thought a bit, and says he to my aunt, I mind the place well. In old Sir Oliver's time, Lame Windle told me there was a door in that recess to the left, where the lassie dreamed she saw my grandmother open it. He was past eighty when he told me that, and I but a boy. 
It's 20 years Sen. The plate and jewels used to be kept there long ago before the iron closet was made in the Arras chamber, and he told me the key had a brass handle, and this ye say was found in the bottom of the kist where she kept her old fans. Now would not it be a queer thing if we found some spoons or diamonds forgot there? Ye mun come up with us, lassie, and point to the very spot. Loath was I and my heart in my mouth, and fast I held by my aunt's hand as I stepped into that awesome room and showed them both how she came and passed me by, and the spot where she stood and where the door seemed to open. There was an old empty press against the wall then, and shoving it aside, sure enough there was the tracing of a door in the wainscot, and a keyhole stopped with wood, and planed across as smooth as the rest, and the joining of the door all stopped with putty the colour a yak, and but for the hinges that showed a bit when the press was shoved aside, ye would not consate there was a door there at all. Ha, says he with a queer smile, this looks like it. It took some minutes with a small chisel and hammer to pick the bit of wood out of the keyhole. The key fitted, sure enough, and with a strang twist and a lang screak, the bolt went back and he pulled the door open. There was another door inside, stranger than the first, but the lax was gone and it opened easy. Inside was a narrow floor and walls and vault of brick. We could not see what was in it, for twas dark as pick. When my aunt had lighted the candle, the squire held it up and stepped in. My aunt stood on tiptoe trying to look over his chauffeur, and I didna see nout. Ha ha, says the squire, stepping backward. What's that? Gee mother poker, quick, says he to my aunt. And as she went to the hearth, I peeps beside his arm, and I sid squat down in the far corner a monkey or a flayin' on the chest, or else the mace shrivelled up wizened old wife that ever was sen on yearth. By Jen, says my aunt, as putting the poker in his hand, she keeked by his chauffeur, and sid the ill-favoured thing, hey a care, sir, what you're doin'? Back we ye and shut to the door. But in place of that he steps in softly with the poker pointed like a sword, and he gives it a poke and down it a tumbles together, head and eye in a heap of bayons and dust, little mire in a hatful. Twas the bayons of a child, and the rest went to dust at a touch. They said now for a while, but he turns round the skull as it lay on the floor. Young as I was, I consated I knew well enough what they was thinking on. A dead cat, says he, pushing back and blowing out the candle and shutting to the door. We'll come back, you and me, Mrs. Shutters, and look on the shelves by and by. I've other matters first to speak to ye about. And this little girl's going aim, ye say. She has her wages, and I mun make her a present, says he, patting my chauffeur with his hand. And he did gim her a good pound, and I went off to Lexo about an hour after, and sir hame by the stagecoach and fain was I to be at hame again, and I never sid Dame Crowl of Applewhale, God be thanked, either in appearance or in dream, at Efter. But when I was grown to be a woman, my aunt spent a day and night with me at Littleham, and she telt me there was no doubt it was the poor little boy that was missing Sir Lang Sen, that was shut up to die there in the dark by that wicked beldame wore his skirls or his prayers, or his thumping cudna be heard, and his hat was left by the water's edge, whoever did it to make belief he was drowned. The clothes at the first touch, I ran into a snuff of dust in the cell where the bayons was found, but there was a handful of jet buttons and a knife with a green heft, together with a couple of pennies the poor little fellow had in his pocket, I suppose, when he was decoyed in thar, and Sid is last of the light. And there was, among the squire's papers, a copy of the notice that was printed after he was lost, when the old squire thought he might have run away or been took by gypsies, and it said he had a green hefted knife with him, and that his buttons were a cut jet. So that is how I have to say consarning old Dame Crowl at Applewhale House. The End Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this story, please feel free to look through my story listings here, which are always being added to. And if you are not already a subscriber, please feel free to subscribe today for fresh notifications of new readings by some of the world's greatest classic authors of the ghost story genre.